Good evening and welcome to Chicago tonight on this Monday, April 1st. We'd love to see a resounding mandate for change. I look forward to victory on April 2nd. A last push from mayoral contenders Tony Preckwinkle and Lori Lightfoot before Chicagoans head to the polls. And what tomorrow's election could mean for the future of city council. The curious case of the measles. Where are we seeing the virus take hold and why doesn't it completely die off? I would hope that he felt we did justice. After a multi-million dollar restoration, an iconic Frank Lloyd Wright home reopens. So, let's play two. A new book on Mr. Cub, Ernie Banks, goes beyond his always sunny disposition to reveal a more complex man. And Chicago artists who use creativity to battle destructive impulses, plus an artist who hasn't spoken in nearly 60 years. All that and more next on Chicago Tonight. Thanks for joining us. I'm Brandis Friedman. Kim Fox is at the center of dueling protests. Amanda Venicky has that story and more of what's making news in Chicago tonight. Amanda. Cook County State's Attorney Kim Fox once again defends her office's decision to dismiss the 16 felony charges facing actor Jesse Smollett. But the decision is still roiling critics, including the city's police union, who questioned Chicago's justice system and see Fox's weak on criminals. That in turn has organizations like Rainbow Push defending Fox. We cannot have people with their charges reduced. We only have to go back a few weeks to know that somebody whose charges were reduced was out on the street and then shot an off-duty police officer. We have to make sure that justice is being followed all the time. We're going to stand with him, Fox. She has made good on her promises. She is the first black female state's attorney in, in this in Cook County. But we got to look at what this really is overall. This is not just an attack on Kim Fox. This is an attack on black elected officials throughout the state. The activists question what they say are the FOP, FOPs, that is, misplaced priorities. Why, they asked, isn't the FOP more concerned about the high level of unsolved murders in the city? Smollett denies staging a hoax attack in late January. The state's attorney's office says a deal requiring he paid $10,000 and perform community service does not mean Smollett is innocent. Without a trial, there's no clear-cut resolution, but the city is trying to get the former Empire actor to pay Chicago back for police overtime costs spent investigating that incident. Meanwhile, R. Kelly's attorney wants Fox's office to preserve any emails between her and celebrity attorney Michael Avenatti, who represents one of Kelly's alleged victims. Kelly's lawyer is also asking the judge to order the state's attorney to make potential witnesses save all of their electronic communications. There are some of the witnesses that have put things on Instagram and so forth uh, that are praising R. Kelly and saying he was the best thing that ever happened to them uh, after they've made an allegation. So I think it's important that all of this information is preserved, especially where someone can just hit a button and delete it. The judge said he'll review the motion and rule on it at the next hearing, scheduled for May 7th. That's also when he's set to rule on whether Kelly can travel for performances. The R&B singer is accused of sex abuse. He wasn't in court today. His lawyer says he wasn't feeling well. There's more on this story on our website. A man who spent 20 years in prison for a murder he didn't commit is suing the city. Anthony Jakes is 42 now. He was 15 when he says Chicago detectives starved and beat him until he confessed. He says it was a false confession and Jakes was exonerated last year. The detectives named in the lawsuit were affiliated with the late disgraced commander John Burge, who was accused of leading a squad that tortured suspects during interrogations. More on the WTTW website. And as for the weather, mostly cloudy tonight with a low around 38. Then tomorrow, a 40% chance of rain in the afternoon. Otherwise, mostly cloudy with a high near 54. And now, Brandis, back to you. Amanda, thank you.
The polls open in less than 12 hours. By this time tomorrow night, the historic 2019 Chicago election will be over and big changes will be coming to city government. Not only will there be a new occupant elected to take over the fifth floor of City Hall, but the city council itself could look and operate in a vastly different way than it has in recent decades. Paris Schutz has the latest in Paris. How were candidates closing the deal today? Well, starting with the mayoral candidates, Brandis, no big giant rallies, just a mad dash across all the Chicago neighborhoods over the weekend, making their closing cases to voters. Lori Lightfoot and Tony Preckwinkle. Lightfoot started the morning at an L stop in Garfield Park. She hit up the north side. She greeted Blue Line commuters at the Jefferson Park, Park Blue Line and Metro stop late this afternoon. She has consistently been up in the polls in this race, but the rhetoric between her and her opponent, Tony Prankwinkle, has been anything but cordial. So she vowed today, if she does win, she will mend fences with her opponent. I think it's important for us to put the campaign behind us and move forward. People are depending on us to be, in a, be adults and be leaders, and I've tried to do that throughout the course of the campaign. And regardless of what's happened, um, I, I want to be able to move forward, and, I, and I'm sure we can have a productive working relationship. Meanwhile, Preckwinkle held a rally early this afternoon on the west side featuring supporters like Congressman Danny Davis and 28th Ward Alderman Jason Irvin. She also hit up some areas on the north side, and she urged her support, supporters, despite what the polls say, go out and get out the vote. We're working very hard. We've worked to identify our voters, and we're going to work to uh, get them out by knocking on doors and making phone calls. And I look forward to victory on April 2nd. In Paris, what about some of the aldermanic races? Well, there are 15 contested races, Brandis. Many incumbents are fighting for their lives. Other seats that have been vacated by current aldermen as you look at a map of the races that are up tomorrow. So there's the 20th Ward where Alderman Willie Cochran recently resigned after pleading guilty to a federal corruption charge. Newcomers Jeanette Taylor and Nicole Johnson are vying for that south side seat. And the same for the 25th Ward War. Danny Solis has been MIA since it was revealed he wore a wire on Alderman Ed Burke and has been the subject of his own allegations. So in that race, there's Byron Sigcho Lopez, a more progressive candidate, and Alexander Acevedo, who's the son of a longtime Madigan-aligned Democratic state rep. They're competing against each other. Then there's the 30th Ward. That's been very contentious. Lots of allegations flying around there. On the northwest side, there's Rahm Emanuel ally Ariel Raboyras trying to fend off a challenge from Jessica Gutierrez, who is the daughter of former Congressman Luis Gutierrez. There's a 33rd Ward, self-described Democratic Socialist Rosana Rodriguez Sanchez, taking on the incumbent Deb Mel. And then the 40th Ward, the floor leader, a city council stalwart, the Finance Committee Chairman, current Chairman Pat O'Connor, challenged by another self-described Democratic Socialist and organizer, former rap artist Andre Vasquez. In Paris, does Rahm Emanuel have any role in all of this, or is he sitting back and watching this whole thing play off? He might be sitting back and watching this thing play off, but tangentially, his fingerprints are all over some of these races. There is a political action committee called Chicago Ford, which has reactivated in recent days. It was it, it created four years ago to support Rahm Emanuel's re-election. So now it's supporting candidates that perhaps will help preserve Emanuel's legacy. So they've given money to a number of candidates in recent days, and those include Roderick Sawyer in the sixth ward, who's also facing a tough re-election challenge, Ray Lopez in 15, Howard Brookins, an incumbent in 21, Samantha Nugent in 39. She's taking on a guy named Robert Murphy, and they're vying to replace the current alderman, Margaret Lorino. Pat O'Connor in the 40th Ward and Jim Kappelman in the 46th Ward, who's facing a challenge from Marianne Lalonde. And then Michael Negron, who worked for Rahm Emanuel, or worked in the administration in the 47th Ward, who's taking on Matt Martin. So this pack has gotten money from another Rahm Emanuel line pack, and they are trying to elect candidates that perhaps would preserve his legacy. Another contested race is city treasurer, and that features Melissa Conyers Irvin going up against 47th Ward Alderman Amea Pawar. Rahm Emanuel, that Rahm Emanuel line pack Chicago Forward has given money to Amea Poar in that race. So whoever could become mayor is dealing with a city council and, and a structure of city government that could be vastly different than this city has seen in decades. And any sense of what turnout, voter turnout is going to look like tomorrow? What election officials are saying is they're predicting about the same level of turnout as it was in February in the primary, about 35 percent 
100,000 or more or less folks have cast their ballots early already, and the bulk of those votes have been residents aged 55 and older. Despite the fact that during the November midterm there were a ton of people, a ton of young people that registered to vote, they have not been showing up in big numbers in any of these uh, municipal elections. Okay, Paris, thank you. We'll see you tomorrow, obviously. Yes, yes you will. <laughs> and if you want more information on candidates before you cast your vote tomorrow, visit our website. There you can hear from mayoral candidates as well as candidates running for alderman and treasurer about their visions for the offices. That's at WTTW.com slash voters guide. Now to Carol Marine and more on tomorrow's election. Carol. Brandis, when <laughs> the candidates are making their final sprint toward tomorrow's election, but will voters show up? And how will the outcome of this race affect city politics in the coming years? Joining us with their expert take on tomorrow's election are three people who've been watching it very closely. Craig Delamore of WBBM News Radio, A.D. Quigg of The Daily Line, and Gregory Pratt of the Chicago Tribune. Welcome all of you back Thank you. to Chicago tonight. So, Craig, you're the dean here. <laughs> <laughs> Most polls... It's another word for old. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good word. Most polls show Lori Lightfoot with a, a sizable lead. Do you believe it? I believe that she has the lead, uh, but I don't know that it's as sizable. There are a lot of people who were still undecided even into last week. Almost 30 percent of people still hadn't made up their minds. Uh, so that's one factor. A lot of those people are older. They might break more for, uh, for Tony Preckwinkle. Uh, the other thing is turnout. That's going to be the, the, the name of the game tomorrow because low turnout favors the usually the organization the the most uh, powerful or, or organized of the candidates and so eighty from the standpoint of tony preckwinkle head of the democratic party of cook county theoretically in the days of old anyway you'd have soldiers you'd have boots on the ground um, you'd have the unions helping them out. Is that what we're seeing? She, st she still definitely has the union support. So she has SEIU, which has donated $4.5 million to her campaign in the past eight months alone, and she has CTU, um, both on the ground, both organized. So that's an advantage for her, but like you said, the machine isn't what it used to be. We don't have every single committeeman in Chicago lining up behind her in the same way that they might have 10, 20, 30 years ago. Well, and in some wards, Greg, there's a machine, but it's a, like in Matt O'Shea's ward, for instance. He's supporting Lori Lightfoot, even though he's a 19th warder in a, you know, in a kind of real legacy ward. And so you can have a machine, but not necessarily the machine. Well, Lori Lightfoot goes all around the city calling it the broken and corrupt political machine, always in that order. And the first word there is broken. And if she ends up beating Tony Preckwinkle by 10 points or more, it really makes you wonder just how broken the machine is and it doesn't exist to your point. You know, there, there are definitely ward organizations and the 19th is one of them, but obviously it hasn't been enough to, to take Preckwinkle to the top. I think a lot of people thought she would be first in the first round and she wasn't. Uh, a candidate with no machine and no organization was first. And so that's a really fascinating dynamic and I wonder how much we can even talk about the machine after the election. Or the organization, for well, that part matter. Part of the difference is now, like, you can't exchange city jobs for working for a ward organization. We've got shackmen going left and right, toppling patronage all over. So the machine just isn't what it once was, and I don't think it could go back to what it was. And voter turnout, do we have a theory on why there is potentially so little excitement? Uh, I think just the the tenor of the campaign the fact that first off that we had 14 uh, candidates in the first round I think probably just got voters bewildered but also we have not had that many we haven't gone to a runoff all that often I'm not sure if people this is the fourth in a hundred years I think yes so it is just a world that people haven't seen before don't forget most of people most people's lifetime there's been a mayor named Daly so money, A.D., you are a money tracker like crazy. Mm -hmm. um, where are the unions and which unions are where? So, like I said earlier, SEIU and CTU are with Tony Preckwinkle. That's the majority of union spending this cycle. Um, laborers moved from Susana Mendoza to Lori Lightfoot. We also see SEIU and CTU spending heavily in these aldermanic races. And other money. Where are we seeing the other money being deposited with these candidates? Well, uh, Tony Preckwinkle is getting most of the donations. Uh, her, her, 
her, her figures are probably at least at least twice what. Uh, it slowed down a little bit, though. Yes. Uh, so, but from the unions, from, uh, from from the unions, Lightfoot's out raised her in the second round, um, and you know she's picked up some daily supporters. She's picked up people who supported Rom. You know, you sort of see the divide where you had people who supported Chewy four years ago and people who supported Rom four years ago, and now they're dividing up in sort of a similar way. Is there some discontent out there among some of the unions that they're spending too much on the mayor's race and investing too little in the aldermanics? Yes. And there's, uh, there's actually, there's a lot of grumbling about that. So for instance, uh, CTU hadn't given a ton of money. They'd given a lot of boots on the ground and a lot of support in the cycle to Tony Preckwinkle, but not a ton of cash. And they gave her $100,000 last week uh, SEIU hasn't given in a little while, but the the CTU thing has got some people grumbling that there's all the mana candidates in ward, wards like the 40th Ward, where if Pat O'Connor, who's seeing an influx of ROM money, ends up beating Andre Vasquez by a point or two, and, and Lori Lightfoot ends up beating Preckwinkle by 10 to 20 points, which is what some people expect, they're going to be really upset that, that the... Uh, Preckwinkle campaign took that money from CTU when it could have helped Aldermanics. I had a union person message me and tell me that they might as well have lit it on fire. You know, now, <laughs> now that... That if, sounds a little bitter. <laughs> if if, if uh, Preckwinkle wins by any margin, then obviously it won't be set on fire. If they if she loses by a significant margin, margin there's going to be a lot of second-guessing and criticism. This is a pretty short little ballot, and but the only other thing besides the Aldermanic and the mayor is the treasurer's race. Any fires being lit on that one between Melissa Conyers Irvin and Amea Pawar? I think there's a lot of money being spent and Melissa Conyers Irvin uh, has been spending the most of it and her commercials were everywhere this past weekend. Uh, Amea Pawar has gotten a lot of uh, you know high profile or at least uh, you know the reform uh, endorsements but the Democratic organization is solidly behind Melissa Conyers Irvin. Yeah. Irvin has a ton of Democratic establishment support. We've seen that Chicago Forward Pack we were talking about earlier donate $100,000 for TV ads for Amayapur in these last few days, but it's so late, I'm not sure it makes that big of a difference. And you've got Jesse White, the Secretary of State, who is a giant statewide vote getter, trying to use his muscle for Preckwinkle and for Melissa Conyers Irvin. Does he have does he have that kind of clout to carry it forward? I I think that he may have in the treasurer's race, but I think the mayor's race has taken on a life of its own and I'm not sure that any single endorsement uh, can really help and in fact there was some talk uh, in the last couple of weeks about one of them uh, Bobby Rush actually hurting her because of how incendiary his remarks were. So when we start looking at these aldermanic races one of my questions is about the Democratic Socialist Party because they seem to have a level of organization a kind of machine of their own and may end up with how many aldermanic seats? As many as five. As many as five. Could it's actually be six. One of them just joined the party, Jeanette Taylor, in the uh -huh. uh, 20th. So it so could maybe be six. six. So what is that? What is that phenomenon that we're seeing? Well, I think I think socialism used to be an unspeakable word where I would say it on this show and get censored for it. <laughs> I think that, or perhaps not this show, but uh, Bernie Sanders has made it cool in some ways for people to identify as socialists and as DSA, and you've got people... Uh, Carlos Ramirez Rosa led the way on that four years ago, and now you have candidates taking on uh, establishment people who are weak in different ways. And it's kind of remarkable that Deb Mel, Mel uh, uh, the daughter of the famous alderman, would be in so much trouble from Rosana Rodriguez in uh, the 33rd Ward, and, uh, and Pat O'Connor, a 30-some-year veteran, is potentially going to lose to a socialist. And the floor leader of city council. I mean, so... That could really upend sort of the centers of gravity in this city council, yeah? And even if it doesn't, I think DSA is going to continue organizing around things like rent control, charter school freezes, and the gang database. I think they'll stay active throughout races to come. Yeah, and these are populist issues that get people riled up, that get people excited. So uh, even the people who don't aren't officially under the Democratic Socialist banner, and I, I, I think, uh, for example, in the uh, 49th, 
uh, we had an act where Joe, know, Moore Joe lost. Moore lost to someone who identifies herself as a socialist. Patricia, Patricia Haddon? Maria, uh, Maria Haddon. Haddon. Maria Haddon. Haddon. Yes. And so this is a movement that is, that is there and is going to be around and have to be reckoned with. How much trouble is uh, Pat O'Connor in in the 40th Ward? I think she, he got a third of the vote and he's been there since 1983. He's in trouble. That doesn't mean he'll lose, but he is in very deep trouble. Yeah, going by donations alone, you could tell folks around him are scared. Yeah. So where's Rahm Emanuel in all of this? We've talked, Paris has talked about his fingerprints, um, some feeling of his presence. Is he heavily engaged in this? He is engaged not directly with what's going on with Chicago Forward, but interestingly, over the last couple of weeks, he has made appearances for things like a, uh, a, the city's cleanup program, well, where he announced how well that is going to be working this year. He did it in the 40th Ward where Pat, with Pat O'Connor standing next to him. He had Ray Lopez standing next to him today when he was talking about things. So he's, he's out there. And he has been doing those piecemeal $20,000 donations throughout the past few weeks as well. And then the revival, as Paris pointed out, of PACs that have had his fingerprints all over them before, right? Yes. Yeah, and he's playing a delicate game where he wants to help people win, but he doesn't want to be blamed if they lose, which is kind of interesting because, uh, you know, some of them are going to lose, just like Joe Moore lost, uh, in no small part because of the perception that he used to be an independent and now he's Rom's guy. So going back to Tony Preckwinkle and Lori Lightfoot, question that I posed before we, before we went on the air. At Operation Push, you have these two women, and Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton are saying, you need to sign this agreement that you're going to get along after, after this. Is that a little patriarchal? I mean, if these weren't two women candidates, did we see Chewy Garcia and Rahm Emanuel being asked to sign a, a you know, non-aggression pact? I don't think we've seen that historically, but we have seen these kinds of pacts, or, or at least trying to get these kind of pacts before. In fact, even uh, when um, uh, uh, no uh, Congresswoman or, and now Senator uh, Carol Mosley Brown. Brown. No, no, yeah, that that's oh, one example. But also our current sen Senator. Uh, why am I? I'm just Tammy. blanking. Tammy Duckworth. Okay. I'm blanking on her name. Sorry, uh, so, sort of but, like playing charades here. Yes, Three I syllables. Know. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but when when she when she won, there was a, there was a, an agreement between them that they were going to get together, and it was going to be a smooth transition. Even Mayor Emanuel now is talking about he wants to be known for a smooth transition. I think we can see that. Uh, I don't know that it's patriarchal. I think it's a matter of necessity that they're going to have to get along. And they may not be friends. I don't think they're going to go out for drinks with each other. But Mark Kirk and Alexei Janulius had a beer summit. But all of that was after. I mean, going into this, it was just a kind of curious thing to me to see to see that being requested. It's, I think uh, I think part of the dynamic is that people have been suggesting. I mean, Chance the Rapper's comments about she's from the north side, her voters are from the north side, and we're from the south and west side is a thinly veiled dog whistle about race. And I think some people have tried to portray Lightfoot as the white candidate, um, which is uh, divisive and which she's decried. And so I think that's where it's coming from. And is it necessary? Probably not. They're both adults. They're both professionals. They, they don't need to be told that, hey, she's going to be board president if she loses. Uh, she's going to be a prominent civic leader if she loses, being Lightfoot. But I so, mean, they don't clearly like each other. I think we can safely yeah. say that with, we'll with, it away. Without, <laughs> <laughs> without sounding too editorial. And at the same time, what Lightfoot was saying today was the, the campaign's got to go away and the government has got to, to take uh, dominance. If you're going to have African-American women running the county and the city, and frankly, also the state's attorney's office, and the African American community is split. Where is your where is your power base? Where where do you have your support? So th this can't serve. They can't survive together unless they work together. So they each need success, and without each other, they may not have it. And we are. Let's be clear, a national story. I mean, this is going to be full headlines, 
whoever wins this as the first African-American woman in the city of Chicago puts a lot of pressure on whoever that is, doesn't it? Yeah, and we also might have three women running all three citywide elected offices. If Melissa Conyers Irvin wins, whoever wins the mayor's race, and Anna Valencia running the clerk's office. This is a, a ladies' city now. And they'll be, they'll all be women of colors, and one of them could be gay, which yeah. is incredible. It is incredible, and we are going to watch it very closely. Thank you all for coming. I know you're busy and you've got deadlines, but we're glad that you're here. Thank you. There's Thank more you. on Chicago Tonight. Stay with us. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by the City Club of Chicago. Smart people may disagree about what makes a great city, but part of what makes Chicago great is that we don't have to agree. To run a city like ours, a lot of issues come up. The City Club of Chicago is a place to debate those issues and hear from the men and women who shape the policies, lead the industries, and tell the stories that define our city. For the free and open exchange of ideas, the City Club of Chicago. Still to come on Chicago Tonight, we step inside Roby House, Frank Lloyd Wright's prairie-style masterpiece to check out the home's latest renovations. Behind the good cheer, Ernie Banks hid a melancholy and lonely man. We talk with the author of a new biography about Mr. Cub. And two local artists, as well as one from New Zealand, stretch the definition of outsider art. But first, measles, a virus once thought to be eradicated in the U.S. less than 20 years ago, seems to be rearing its head again with a growing number of confirmed cases every year. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, 2019 is already seeing the second highest number of cases in nearly two decades. Seven of those have been confirmed in Illinois, including one just last week in Cook County. And elsewhere, the outbreaks are even worse. There's been such a large outbreak in Rockland County in New York that public oh, officials there have declared a state of emergency that bars kids and teens who are not vaccinated against measles from going to public places. Here to talk about why we're seeing more cases in some years than others and why the virus hasn't completely gone away is Dr. Allison Arwoody. She's the chief medical officer at the Chicago Department of Public Health. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. So what do we know first about this measles case that was confirmed in Cook County last week? Sure. So measles is something that the health department unfortunately has gotten used to dealing with. Um, when we have a case that develops, um, we don't typically release details about that individual. The important thing is making sure that we know uh, people who may have been exposed to that person and doing everything we can to identify them um, and prevent the spread of measles where we can. And so that's really been our primary focus. Uh, last week, for example, the Cook County Department of Public Health put out a list of 18 different public places where this individual had uh, visited during the time um, that they were uh, contagious or infectious. And we're doing a lot of work to follow up with people who may not have been vaccinated um, in those public spaces. And just so our viewers know, where was this case? So um, again, the case lives in Cook County, um, right. but then visited a lot of different locations. It's available on the website if they have particular uh, okay, questions. North Shore area. North Shore area in Chicago. In, yes, exactly. Like lots of places. As any of us, you know, you're out and about and somebody may not realize that they have the measles before they develop a rash. They're still contagious during that period. Um, and as we just mentioned, 2019 is seeing the second highest number of cases uh, since it was eradicated in 2000. Why is that? So it's interesting. Um, although measles officially, right, in 2000 was sort of considered um, eradicated here in the U.S., it's still a big problem around the world, and it's a serious problem. There are about 90,000 people who die of measles every year around the world. And when we have people traveling from the U.S. to other countries um, where measles is not eradicated, if they themselves have not been vaccinated or are not immune, they can catch measles, bring it back into the U.S., and then if they go on to be in contact with people who themselves have not been vaccinated, uh, that's when we can really start to see significant spread. Um, and an outbreak consists of three or more cases in a single area. Where else are we seeing actual outbreaks? So we see them pop up, you know, really around the U.S. I think there's probably six or seven sort of in different locations around the U.S. Um, but what we really pay attention to is where we see a large outbreak internationally, the CDC will put out a travel alert so if people are traveling you can look at the CDC site and know if there's been meals recently in that area and then we also look domestically to understand where we're seeing cases so you mentioned um, in New York for example
example. Right. Um, and we know that there had been, you know, a number of cases where people had traveled to Israel um, and then some spread in the Orthodox Jewish community. And so here in Chicago, uh, we reached out to members of the Orthodox Jewish community, including uh, the leadership, um, the rabbis and the people who, you know, might help people make decisions about vaccination uh, a number of months ago to really put out some strong statements, not just from the health department, but from religious leaders encouraging vaccination. So when we do that, it can really help limit, um, you know, the amount of spread that we may see uh, locally. Now, there are seven confirmed cases in Illinois, but a lot more elsewhere. As we said, 157 confirmed cases in that county, Rockland County, New York. Mm -hmm. Why is such a difference? So again, this mostly gets back to where you have pockets of people who have not been vaccinated. This is generally a vaccine preventable disease. One dose of, vac of the measles vaccine is 93% protective and two doses are 97% protective. Most kids get those vaccines, you know, at w about age one and between ages four and six. But if there are groups that have not gotten vaccinated, it can spread because it's so contagious. So for example, a few years ago, I worked on an outbreak here in Cook County that got into a daycare and virtually almost every child who was under the age of one ended up getting the measles and then it can spread from there. So it's it's one of the most contagious viruses, unfortunately, that, that we have and that we know. And so even one case, if you're in a population that is not well vaccinated, um, we can see significant spread. Tell us about exemptions in Illinois. How do those work? Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to. Um, so there's usually, and when we talk about exemptions, it usually has to do with sort of school exemptions. So um, when a child starts school, uh, there's a requirement generally for vaccination. And there's three types that are considered for exemption kind of around the country. One is a medical exemption, and that's very straightforward. There are children who may have an immune system problem or other reasons can't get vaccinated. That is very acceptable. Um, and then there are, there's one called sort of a philosophical exemption and then there are religious exemptions and the philosophical or personal exemption is when someone just says I don't believe in vaccines I don't want them and that's enough to not have their child vaccinated there's about 17 states that ha that that is true but in Illinois we do not have a philosophical or personal exemption we have a religious exemption but in 2015 there was some work done across the state where we actually made it um, a little bit more challenging to get a religious exemption Parents can still get it, but they have to write in detail why the religious exemption should be granted. They have to sign it. And a health care provider, like a pediatrician, has to sign a form that they have counseled the person um, about the risks of not getting vaccinated and the benefits of being vaccinated. So with all of that, we're at a point where about 94% of um, our children in Chicago in that sort of 17 month to three years have gotten at least one dose of measles vaccine. So room to grow, but definitely, you know, the, that that strong exemption standpoint is part of why we have reasonably good um, vaccination coverage here in Chicago. And, and refresh our memories. What is the measles sure. symptoms? How is it spread? Yeah, definitely. So um, it's a respiratory virus. Um, like I said, it is very infectious and preventable by by vaccine. And it generally starts with a high fever and then sort of cough and cold symptoms, runny nose, red eyes. Three to five days later, people will develop a rash usually starts kind of at the hairline and then runs all the way down the body. Um, and with that, um, they are contagious sort of four days before the rash starts all the way till four days after it. And it's so contagious. Like if I had the measles and I were here talking to you, there's about a 90% chance if you did not have a vaccine um, or you weren't immune to the measles that you would actually get it. Um, and so it can go on to have serious consequences, um, especially in sort of infants and babies. We worry because it, you can, after having the measles virus, you can develop a pneumonia, you can develop infection sort of around the brain. Um, we see deafness associated with it. We see long-term brain damage associated with it. And then rarely um, we can see death associated with it. And before we let you go, um, you know, aside from just not wanting to get my sick myself, there are, there's the herd immunity reason for getting the vaccine as well. Tell me about that. That's right. So we sometimes, will, we. We use this terminology, take one for the team, um, because we recognize that there are individuals like people who have immune system problems, who are undergoing cancer treatments, who may not be able to get vaccinated. And it's really important that people get 
their kids especially vaccinated. They should get that first dose between 12 and 15 months, that second dose between four and six months. It's protecting, you know, you, your child first, but it's also protecting the community. And if we all, you know, can really work to get, get all of our kids vaccinated, you'll have that lifelong immunity and be protected towards measles. So when we do have a case, uh, you know, you don't have to worry very much. Um, and that's that's what the health department would like everybody to do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Allison Arwady, Chief Medical Officer at the Chicago Department of Health. Thank you. Thank you. In 1991, the American Institute of Architects named Frank Lloyd Wright's Roby House one of the 10 most significant structures of the 20th century. The Hyde Park home was recently closed while preservationists put millions into restoring it, and now it's reopened to its former glory. Chicago Tonight's Evan Garcia visited the Roby House to learn more. The Frederick C. Roby House, one of architect Frank Lloyd Wright's most beloved works, is reopening to the public after a massive multi-million dollar restoration. This was really his last true prairie style house. Finished in 1910, the rectangular Roby House epitomizes Wright's prairie school of architecture. Long horizontal lines, low overhanging eaves, bands of windows. But after several different owners, the Roby House began to lose its original identity. I would hope that he felt we did justice. Following years of research and fundraising, the Frank Lloyd Wright Trust started restoring the interior of the home in January of 2018. But again, you can appreciate the art glass windows. That meant recreating Wright's original color schemes and wall textures. What we've done in here is actually repair and replace plaster that didn't match the original texture of the walls. After that, we were able to apply paint finishes to bring it back to its original appearance. Even bringing back outdated lighting was important. Almost all of the wood frames for those uh, orb lights is original. Um, we created replica glass orbs because glass today tends to be too pure. And back then it would have been cloudy and particulate would have been found in it. So we ultimately settled on smoking the glass. Uh, and as a result, we we're able to get that original appearance of how the light filtered through. Perhaps most impressively, some original items have returned to the home. The guest room is now full of furniture designed by Wright, and the dining room has one notable addition. We now have the original Roby House dining room table back on display here in the dining room. So this is the table that Frank Lloyd Wright designed for Roby House. Other items were reconstructed based on photographs and research, like the home's original front door, which was shattered during a student war protest in the 1960s, or this ingle nook next to the fireplace. But the ingle nook provided a place for someone to sit by the warm fire, especially on a cold winter Chicago day. These new additions give greater shape to Wright's original interior design vision. If you have a wide open space, it's not very comfortable. It doesn't feel like a home. So by using these kinds of gestures, essentially, in this space, you create rooms within rooms uh, and make those intimate experiences that make a home what it is. Like any historic home bearing the Chicago elements, upkeep is always a work in progress. The idea, of course, is to build a plan where we're able to attack issues as they come up and then continue do doing that in a cycle. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Evan Garcia. The Roby House is owned by the University of Chicago, but the Frank Lloyd Wright Trust preserves and manages the home. They said Roby House's exterior and interior restorations totaled about $11 million, raised through donations, tour ticket revenue, and grants. To learn more, you can visit our website. They call him Mr. Cub, but under his outwardly happy spirit, Ernie Banks was a much more complicated man. To the fans, Banks was a sure bet, playing in 14 All-Star games, winning two MVPs, a Gold Glove Award, and twice leading the major leagues in home runs and runs batted in. He made the Hall of Fame the first year he was eligible. But despite outslugging Willie Mays, Hank Aaron, and Mickey Mantle when they were in their prime, Banks never played in the World Series, a fact that stung him throughout his life. There's now a new book that examines the ups and downs, bearing his signature phrase as the title. The book, Let's Play 2, The Legend of Mr. Cub, The Life of Ernie Banks. 
Joining us is the author, journalist Ron Rappaport, who spent two decades as a sports columnist for the Chicago Sun-Times. He's also written for the Los Angeles Times, the Los Angeles Daily News, and the Associated Press. He was also a longtime sports commentator on National Public Radio. Ron Rappaport, welcome back to Chicago tonight. Thanks for having me, Brent. It's good to be here. Absolutely. So the book, uh, it had a few fits and starts. Tell us how this book came about. Well, it began as an autobiography. Ernie and I were both living in California, and I thought I had him convinced to write an autobiography that would dig a little deeper than the sunny, smiley, happy face image that he'd always portrayed. And we talked about it for a while. We got some good work done talking about growing up in segregated and uh, very poor Dallas, taking a year off of school to help his dad pick cotton, playing for Buck O'Neill in the Negro Leagues, coming to Chicago and adjusting to the first white setting he'd ever been because he'd always only been around black people. Um, playing for those god-awful teams in the 50s and 60s, his poisonous relationship with Leo DeRocher. I thought we were really, the problems he was having after, um, after he retired, uh, four wives, four marriages that ended badly, estrangement from his children. I thought we were making real progress and then he decided he didn't want to do it, which kind of broke my heart because we were getting to the real story of what Ernie was all about. When he died, I decided to turn it into a biography so starting in Dallas, where he spent the first 18 years of his life, and moving through um, his whole life, I talked to people who knew him and were friends with him and family. His older sister Edna's still alive, she's 90. Um, talked to his sons, talked to an ex-wife, and then his teammates, Billy and Fergie and Randy and Don Kessinger and the rest, trying to get a rounded view of the man behind the smile. And that's what Let's Play 2 attempts to do. He often deflected talking about himself. So even when working with him, how were, how were you able to, to get to his part of the story? He had decided that he was going to cooperate. And once he did, he dug very deep. Ernie could be very analytical. But in public, you're absolutely right. He wouldn't talk about himself. And that's what Let's Play 2 was all about. People would come up and talk to Ernie and say, golly, I got a chance to talk to my idol, Ernie Banks, and then stop and say, but all we talked about was me. Ernie play defense by going on offense. If he could deflect the conversation, if he could make it all about you, then nobody would dig deep into, into who he was and he could hide himself. Here's the problem. He created this persona and he lived with it so, for so long that one of his twin sons, Jerry, said he became a prisoner of it. Then I talked to one of his ex-wives, Marjorie Lott, who he met when he was, she was working for the Chicago Transit Authority. He was on the board. And they spent many years together and she said something that really struck me if only he could have been as happy as he pretended to be. What belied that sunny disposition that he put on so well? You know he led a complicated, uh, uh, complex, a melancholy, at the end quite lonely life. He had the same problems that all of us have and by trying to pretend that he wasn't uh, beset by any of those problems, he really did himself a disservice. And towards the end, it was very difficult for him to relate. His marriages, I'm convinced, ended because it was hard for him to relate to people, um, to relate to his wives, to, to uh, discuss intimate things. Uh, one of, uh, Jerry, again, Banks told me that when there was trouble at home, you know, two rambunctious young sons, he'd, he'd get up and drive away. Or, you know, his, when his mother would say, when, uh, wait till your dad gets home. Well, the Cubs on a road trip, they'd say, when, in two weeks? Ernie was, was dis, dis, disengaged from things, and he could never really see past that. It even earned him a nickname when he was growing up in Dallas from his friends, his Well, buddies. it started in Dallas. The thing you have to understand about Ernie is he was always running away from controversy. He didn't want any kind of controversy or arguments or anything, and it started in Dallas. He ran with some buddies, and whenever they got in trouble, they turned around and he was gone. So his nickname when he was a teenager was Casper the Ghost. And that lasted throughout his life. That if there was trouble at home, he walked away from it. If there was trouble with Leo DeRocher, who treated him terribly, both in publicly and privately, he just accepted it. He didn't fight back. Doug Harvey, it even extended onto the baseball field. There was a very imperious umpire named Doug Harvey. They called him God, the players. And I talked to him and he said, Ernie never argued a pitch. He never even turned around and looked back at the umpire to say as if, well, what are you calling a pitch like that for? It, it was amazing how Ernie just never wanted to get involved in anything. And 
or any kind of controversy. And when Hank Aaron called him in, th in the 60s, when the Civil Rights Movement was heating up, Ernie refused to do that. And he took a lot of heat for it. But that was Ernie. He just wanted everything to run smoothly. Well, all of us know that life doesn't always run smoothly. So I think it was hard for him to deal with some of the difficulties and problems in his life. And that's what led to his being alone in Chicago the last eight or nine years of his life. He left his fourth wife. His kids were back in California. He didn't really have a whole lot to, uh, to do. The Cubs had him working at Wrigley Field. They took good care of him, actually. They paid for his uh, apartment at Trump Tower. They kept him on the payroll. But Ernie was really kind of a lost soul in his last years. You also write in his early years, of course, he came from a big, poor family, wasn't initially interested in playing baseball until his father uh, agreed to pay him. Um, and there's a story about how his sister took a cut of well, those Edna, payments. Well, who I talked to, and she told me this story. Ernie, you know, you think of him as a baseball player, but he played football in high school. There really wasn't a baseball diamond. And he played softball. Well, his dad was a, a catcher for a, a, a semi-pro Negro Leagues team, the Dallas Green Monarchs in Dallas. And he wanted to go out and play in the backyard with Ernie. And he bought him a glove, which was hard. There was very little money. He found the money to buy a glove and said, let's go out and play. Ernie didn't want to do it. So he said, I'll pay you a nickel. Well, Edna popped in and said, he'll pay you the nickel, but I get two cents out of the nickel. And Ernie said, what are you, my agent? <laughs> but that's, that's the way she told the story. You know, he was the second of 12 kids. They lived in a shotgun house in, a, uh, in Dallas where you open the front door and you look through and there's the back door straight through. No indoor plumbing, privy in the back, no electricity, wood burning stove. I mean, it was poor. And yet it was a neighborhood where any adult could discipline any child. He had parents who loved him. He went to a pretty good school, the Booker T. Washington School. He learned a fair amount. But he was lucky that he could play this game. And when he finally discovered it, he was really good at it. So later, he came to the Cubs uh, in September 1953, the team's first black player. The Cubs manager, Leo DeRocher, as you mentioned, treated him miserably. Well, that was later. That was in the 60s when Leo came in. He was the Cubs' first black player, and he caused, he, he and Gene Bank, Gene Baker, who was a, a, an infielder, uh, they were the, and they had to deal with being in Chicago, being in a, a, an integrated situation. When DeRocher came along, it was, it was war. Leo couldn't stand somebody being more popular than he was, and he would denigrate him in public, Tell the writers in Ernie's hearing, knock off that Mr. Cub crap, Mr. Cub, my ass. Uh, he's an old man. Called him Gramps and Grandpa. Ran us in the locker room. It was worse. He would humiliate him. He'd sit and go on these harangues. And, and for, for many minutes that would go on, and Ernie would look around and see his teammates who loved him and adored him, thought, you know, uh, respected him. They would be looking at him with pity in his eyes, in their eyes. And it really hurt him. It really upset him. But he never defended himself, no, no matter how nasty it got, in the interest of avoiding confrontation. For the rest of his life, he never said anything bad about Leo in public. In private, he said plenty. He, oh, Leo was just trying to motivate me. I was getting older. I needed a kick in the pants. He, Ernie just would never, ever uh, uh, complain or, or get, get involved with any kind of controversy. He just, that was the way his, his life was built. There are uh, several versions of the story about how he came to say his phrase, let's play two. Tell us a few of those. What's, and what's the one you're, you believe? Well, he, he, he invented, he kept inventing them, and he kept saying, uh, he didn't even pick a year. It's 1967, I'm driving down Lakeshore Drive, and it's a beautiful day, and I thought, let's play two. No, it was 1969, and I was driving through the inner city, and it was really hot. And I got to the ballpark, and the players were all dragging, and I said, let's play two. And he had four or five other versions. I believe that it started... Uh, earlier than that because there was they played a game in Houston against the Colt 45s in an old ballpark with no sun, no, no shade. And it was so hot that Ernie collapsed in the first game of a doubleheader. And then he couldn't play the second game. So Billy Williams and Al Spangler, who was, who was playing for the Colt 45s and, and later joined the Cubs, said, ha ha, you say let's play two. You couldn't even do one. What I love about it is in 1980, in 2013, he gets the um, Medal of Freedom Award from Barack Obama, and Ernie was thrilled because he knew Barack here in Chicago. He, you know, he knew him as an aspiring young politician. So Obama puts the, um, the, the medal around his neck, and then he proceeds to talk about Ernie and his sunny attitude, and he repeats one of the false made-up stories that Ernie made about the origin of Let's Play Two. I love it. But it's just, 
enduring contribution to the American vocabulary. I have a Google alert for it, and I, I get a hit all the time. People are doing, saying, let's play two, and they tend to say in the immortal words of Ernie Banks, or as Ernie Banks once said, so the phrase, let's play two, is going to outlive us all, I think. <laughs> uh, before I let you go, the fact that he never played in the World Series was devastating to him. How'd that affect him? Broke his heart. Broke his heart. He pretended that it was, well, it was one of those things. He would go to Cooperstown. He'd see the other players year after year. He'd, and he'd be the only one in the room who hadn't played in the World Series. He'd go up and ask Reggie Jackson or Lou Brock, what was it like not to play? What was it like to play in a World Series? They said, oh, Ernie, you were playing for the Cubs. You were never going to get there. And it was so bad that he told me he saw a psychiatrist. Stop me cold. Couldn't believe it. It was so, it was, he just was, re, it really hurt him. What was a psychiatrist going to tell him? You did your best. It wasn't good enough. It really hurt him. Ron Rappaport, thank you for joining us. Pleasure to be with you. Again, the book is Let's Play Two. The le speaking of, Let's Play Two, <laughs> The Legend of Mr. Cub, The Life of Ernie Banks. And you can meet Ron Rappaport and Ernie Banks' teammate, Rich Nye, tomorrow at the Frugal Muse in Darien. You'll find all the information and you can read an excerpt on our website. The term outsider artist is big enough to include a creative person without classical training and a silent artist who communicates only through the mysterious pictures she makes. A dual art show in town looks at works by artists from Chicago all the way to Auckland, New Zealand. All of them make the case for art as therapy. At Intuit, the Center for Intuitive and Outsider Art, a pair of new shows couldn't be more different. On one side, cartoon worlds created by a New Zealand artist who hasn't spoken in more than 50 years. On the other side, works by two Chicago artists who fight addiction with creativity. For this, Intuit brought in a curator who ran the Southside Community Arts Center for six years. We're in a space of outside art. At the Southside Community Arts Center, they're not called outsider artists, they're called artists. Labels are real important to this institution and we need to challenge labels but also kind of bolster them and figure out when to leverage them. So it's exciting for these artists to be able to tap into something, a whole community of artists that traditionally would, would not be in dialogue with. He chose artists with colorful work and colorful lives. I left Chicago in 2007 in order to join the Army. Uh, I was 38 years old. I was going through a really rough patch. Uh, it was my own form of treatment. Um, in order to overcome my own personal addictions and also to support my daughters. Early on, Robert Johnson painted the glass on discarded windows, but he stopped making art for years while in the Army. Now, he has a new approach. I've kind of shifted to different materials, canvas board, kind of found canvases from thrift stores and things like that, uh, that I just rework. But I do still have a basement full of windows that I will be giving some attention to. <laughs> We asked the other Chicago artist in this show about using art as therapy. I'm using it now to kind of um, keep me anchored because I'm really struggling to stay clean and stay healthy. Um, it's very important for me and my son. Nix's work includes sculpture, metalwork, and collage. This one is called Heroin the Musical. I'll start maybe with an idea that may totally change by the time I'm finished with the piece. And what happens is I start creating stories in my mind as I'm working on the piece, kind of narratives that only make sense to me. And they become, the piece kind of evolves out of that and becomes part of this narrative in my head that, you know, would seem like nonsense to someone else. In the gallery next door, cartoon narratives have an unusual origin. They were created by Susan Takerangi King, a now 68-year-old New Zealander who hasn't spoken in almost 60 years. Susan was one of 12 children, and she began uh, creating art at a very young age, received much support from her family. She quit speaking by the age of eight, and so we'll never quite know exactly the, the meaning behind uh, each individual artwork. Coupled with these, uh, these wonderful drawings, we have the archives of her sister, Petita Cole, who has begun collecting works that relate to Susan's uh, life and artwork. We spoke to her sister about growing up with a unique sibling, at first in rural New Zealand. There wasn't really a school for Susan in the small town uh, because she um, had special needs. Um, there was no diagnosis, but she was a little different. She couldn't talk, though she was talking prolifically 
as a three-year-old. In order to address Susan's educational needs, we, uh, the family shifted to Auckland. Susan stopped drawing for almost 20 years and then resumed her work in 2008. Her life story became the basis for a feature-length documentary. She keeps to herself, um, she draws in the background, and we always know they're great drawings, but there's not really any, or very little, if any, you know, interaction. In recent years, her work has been shown in Paris, New York, and now Chicago. Now it's like everybody's rallying around Susan, you know, it's like <laughs> she's a man, you know. The work by the two Chicago artists will be on view at Intuit, the Center for Intuitive and Outsider Art, through April 21st. The drawings by the New Zealand artist are on view until August, and you can find out more on our website. That's our show for this Monday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, wttw.com news. You can also watch via podcast and the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night live at 7. We'll be live at the election night headquarters of mayoral candidates Tony Preckwinkle and Lori Lightfoot. And voters in 15 wards will be de deciding the makeup of the next city council. We'll have those results as well. And coming up later tonight, in-depth profiles of mayoral candidates Lori Lightfoot and Tony Preckwinkle in The Choice for Mayor, a WTTW news special. That's airing at 9 o'clock tonight. And we'll leave you with Portraits by Rembrandt on display at the Art Institute of Chicago through June 9th. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. Thank you for watching. Good night. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, proud sponsors of the 25th Annual Clifford Symposium on Tort Law and Social Policy, held at DePaul University College of Law, April 25th and 26th.